And so before we continue to study and submerge into the, our inheritance, the unchanging epigraph of the study of our inheritance in Jesus Christ is the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so those, of course, that are in Jesus Christ, all that is will be fulfilled that is written in the laws, prophets, and psalms, so that we as the participants of the body of Christ would share together with Christ all the things that are to be fulfilled that are written about him in scripture, we will continue to study our collaboration with the truth of the word of God and with the Holy Spirit, revealing that truth, looking at what we need to do from our side to receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so that we can put on the new way of life. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. <coughs> we note that to fulfill this commanding order, we have been studying three charging and fundamental acts to put off, be renewed, and put on. We have noted that it is specifically your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting acts, put off, be renewed, and put on, that will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath. More specifically, will the coming about of our salvation happen that is given to us in the format of a guarantee, or will we lose it forever, which is which results then in our name being forever blotted out of the book of life, although it may have been written there at one time. In a specific format, we've already studied the first two questions and stopped to study the third question. What conditions do we need to fulfill so that by, by the means of an already renewed mind, we begin the process of clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holy truth. Relevant to clothing ourselves into the power of our new person, who contains the power of the resurrection of Christ and the all armor of light, we've concluded that we really need God's help in the form of His redeeming mercy. The means of receiving any kind of help, this help demonstrated in the form of the inheritance of the mercies of God, is the armor of prayer or worship in spirit and in truth. We have noted that the genesis of prayer is inherent to the genesis of God, as it's always existed and revealed itself where God abides. Therefore, the extent or degree of our knowledge of God and His will absolutely depends on the extent of our understanding of the genesis of prayer, which is the language means and right to communicate with God. This is specifically why the priest needed 30 years to study, to study uh, how to build the altar and the offering or the order of the offerings. <clears throat> and so you need to learn the, st the state of your heart and the worshiper of God and the conditions or requirements. Erecting an altar identifying the state of the heart and prayer of a worshiper of God, as well as the sacrifice that is brought upon such an altar, identifying the legit and rightful status of prayer, belonged exclusively to those people that were clothed into the rightful virtue and status of a priest. A person that is clothed into the rank of a, and virtue of a priest is a person that is clothed into the virtue of legitimate median or intercessor. This person is trusted by God with the right by the means of legitimate prayer that satisfies the demands of his will and what is the language of God to approach God and enter into the presence of God in order to present his rights and interests that are demonstrated in his will. One of these prayers is written in the 143rd Psalm of David and this psalm opens up the conditions based upon which a person is called to form a legitimate foundation for God so that God's mercy may intervene into our life as well as the boundaries of those areas we rule over and that we carry responsibility for before God. This psalm has become the subject of our next studies. And so Psalm 
143, this has become our prayer, a prayer that contains those arguments that we present to God, that give him the basis to respond to us. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul, he has crushed my life to the ground, he has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me, my heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old, I meditate on all your works, I muse on the works of your hands, I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake, for your righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. We note that the phrase, cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, indicates the early morning that follows the dark night. This symbolizes the resurrection of Christ, which we can see in the law of the spirit of life, which is called to deliver our body from the law of sin and death, and so destroy the stronghold of death within our body and erect the stronghold of the resurrection of Christ in its place. Therefore, in order for David as well as us to hear the mercy of God early in the power of the resurrection of Christ as a result of the given to us by God redemption that is in Christ Jesus and by Christ Jesus, it was necessary for David and necessary for us to present to God a legitimate foundation or a specific right that is imprinted upon the tablets of our heart. We cannot present to God these arguments and this basis, just praying words of scripture until they are imprinted as a seal or as a signet upon our heart. A legitimate foundation upon the tablets of our heart in the given prayer are ten unique in their nature arguments identified as the governing and almighty words of God converted into promises as an inheritance and commandments that we need to present to God as the consistency of our heart, telling God, hear me in your faithfulness and righteousness. This means, hear me for, your, for the sake of your faithfulness and righteousness that is within my heart. Hear me for the sake of remembering the days of old and all of your works that are in my heart. Hear me for I spread out my hands to you and only to you. Hear me for in you do I trust. You see in my heart that I trust you and there's no other uh, 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 item or thing that I can trust upon. Hear me for I lift up my soul to you. Hear me because in you I take shelter. Hear me for you are my God. Hear me for your name's sake. Hear me for your righteousness sake. Hear me because I am your servant. In the previous services, we already looked at the nature of the first argument and stopped to study the second argument. The second argument is evidence that David's heart contained memories of the days of old and all of the works that were done by God in those old days, which David confessed and presented in prayer. We have noted that the symbol of this evidence is the breastplate of judgment of the high priest, which was an item of unique and continual remembrance or a memorial before God identifying with itself the legitimate example of continual prayer, with which we as kings and priests of the new covenant are to approach God in Christ Jesus. And this breastplate of judgment was created for and served only one element within the heart of a man. This is the Urim and Thummim, the presence of which allowed God to hear man and allowed man to hear God.
The symbol of the breastplate of judgment is a symbol of the conscience of a man cleansed from dead works, upon the tablets of whom, in the twelve names of the patriarchs, the image of the status of legitimate prayer that satisfies the demands of the elementary principles of Christ is imprinted. The twelve golden settings is the government and order of God contained in the principles of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. It identifies the order of God that we as worshippers of God are called to demonstrate before the face of God and the legitimate foundation of our continual prayer. The twelve precious stones with engraved upon them as a signet names of the sons of Israel is a symbol and format of our continual prayer, presenting with itself the perfect judgments of God contained in the elementary principles of Christ. With this we conclude that it wasn't the golden settings in the form of the truth of the word of God that were adjusted in size and configuration to fit the precious stones, but the precious stones themselves in the form of our prayers are the ones that were adjusted and are adjusted in size and configuration to fit the golden settings of truth. Our prayer needs to be in accordance to the demands of the will of God, which is why the revelation of God in the form of the Urim can only exist within the boundaries of the truth, which in the th is the thummim in the heart of a man, demonstrating the principles of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. As it is written, I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. Exodus 31, 6. We know that the friendship of the Thummim and Urim within the heart of a person is the unification of two formats of godly wisdom. It states that the carriers of the Thummim and Urim are the true worshippers of God and possess the immune system of the Holy Spirit. In a specific format, we've already looked at seven qualities that the heart of a warrior in prayer possesses in the first seven precious stones of the breastplate of judgment, by which God can continually bring about His will upon planet Earth and stop to study the eighth quality and the eighth precious stone upon the breastplate of judgment of our heart presented in the virtue of the precious agate stone. The name carved upon the second precious stone of the breastplate of judgment located in the third row from the bottom upon the tablets of our heart being a continual memorial before God is the name of Asher. He is the eighth son of Jacob, and his name means a captive of blissfulness or blessing. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, How happy I am. The women will call me happy. So she named him Asher. Genesis 30, 12-13. We will remember that when translated from the Greek word agat, it means blessed, which absolutely corresponds to the meaning of the name Asher written upon this stone. The name of God presented in the precious agate according to the conclusions of the Jewish rabbinate is El Elyon, which means most high. This directs to the unlimited and sovereign authority or power of God in his unlimited expanse, which he fills with himself due to his omnipresence. According to the definition of the name of Asher that is written upon the precious agate stone, the eighth fundamental principle contained in continual prayer with which we need to come to God in our prayer is the function demonstrated in our voluntary dependence, we becoming a blessed captive of God capable of collaborating our prayer with the name of God, El Elyon, or God Most High. Relevant to the subject, we've already studied a series of parables and, and events that we became familiar with and their conditions. We learned that we can fulfill these conditions by the name of God Most High and destroy the stronghold of death within our body in the form of, of the reigning in its sin. This reigning sin identifies the essence of our old person with his deeds, so that we would cast him from our body to hell with noise and afterwards erect the stronghold of the kingdom of heaven in the form of the stronghold of eternal life in place of the stronghold of death within our body and stop to look at the next condition. This condition consists in the 18th Psalm of David 
where the Holy Spirit with the right that He alone has reveals the conditions based upon which we are called to collaborate our, fa our faith prayer with the name of God El Elyon or God Most High. And this condition consists of us being able to call upon the Most High in our hardship as to our God and proclaim the faith of our heart, stating who God is to us in Christ Jesus and what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. We've noted that this is one of the most powerful and voluminous symbols where we see the collaboration of our renewed mind in the form of King David and the name of God Most High, and also the confrontation of our renewed mind with our carnal mind in the form of King Saul together with reigning sin in the form of our old person with his deeds. Because it is by the means of the confession of the faith of our heart stating who God is for us in Christ Jesus and what God has done in Christ Jesus. God received the required basis or grounds to join the battle for our earthly bodies in order to shame the old person by the power of his redemption and forever cast him out into hell with noise. By its character, the prayer psalm of David contains three parts where we see an example of the character of legitimate prayer. The first part identifies the condition or state of David's heart as a warrior in prayer. The condition of his heart was grounds for a legitimate status of his prayer. The second part reveals the consistency of legitimate prayer, which gave God the basis to deliver David from the hand of all his enemies, including Saul. The third part describes the prayer battle itself, which surpasses the comprehension of the human mind. It is in a specific format that we have studied and looked at the first part and stopped to study the second part. Therefore, before we confess our promised lot that is contained in the name of God, it is necessary to know the essence of these names with your heart and you know them by the preached words spoken by God's delegated people. Getting to know and confessing the power contained in the heart of David in the, eighth, in the eight following names of God allowed David to love and call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, to be saved, from his enemies. As for God, discovering the truth of his names in the heart of David provided God grounds to utilize his abilities that consist in his eight names to battle against the enemies of David. And here are these eight names, Psalm 18, 1 through 3. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. And so worthy to be praised. And so the eight names that David had proclaimed here that he relied upon and understood when he stated them. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my deliverer. The Lord my strength in whom I will trust. The Lord is my shield. The Lord is the horn of my salvation. The Lord is my stronghold. Studying the essence of the characteristics of strength as the name of God Most High, this is the first name, we note that it is referring to such a nature of unearthly and eternal strength, the quality of which and characteristics of which have always been and continue to be holy and unchanging in form and inner consistency. We note that identifying the essence of might contained in unearthly strength is the virtue of the name of God Most High, and we note that we will not find this definition in any human dictionary of the world. Yes, a person can look at what strength, uh, stronghold, all of these uh, names, what the definitions of them in the dictionary, but what is written in scripture and what the Holy Spirit implied in these names are not found in the dictionary. In Hebrew, the word strength, as it refers to the nature of God and the character of his word, contains these unearthly virtues. 
This is a constructive and destructive power of the Word of the Most High. This is might, greatness, and potential of the Word of the Most High, the abilities and capabilities of the Most High, the righteousness of the Most High and holiness of the Most High, sufficiency of the Most High and abundance of riches of the Most High, the immovability and faithfulness of the Most High when it comes to His Word, the durability of the Most High and beauty of the Most High, the unchanging nature of the Most High in form, quality, and status. As all of the names of God Most High possess power only within the heart of men and only those men that in, ge in their genealogy and state are in the image and likeness of God. Relevant to studying strength as the name of, of God Most High, we came to the necessity to look at four classical questions. First, what characteristics do we see in Scripture for strength as the name of God Most High? Second, what purpose is the power contained in strength as the name of God Most High called to fulfill? Third, what conditions do we need to fulfill to provide God grounds or a foundation to reveal the potential of strength in the battle against our enemies? And fourth, by what signs do we need to examine ourselves on the abiding presence of the power of the strength of God most high within our heart. In a specific format as, as much as God has allowed and the measure of our faith, we already looked the, at the essence of the first question and stopped to study the second question. What purpose is the power contained in strength as the name of God most high called to fulfill? Relevant to this, we have already studied strength as the name of God Most High in the heart of a man and stop to look at the next purpose where we are called to push the peoples to the ends of our earth in the form of an earthly body that is redeemed by God from sin and death. The enemy nations that are called to be pushed to the end of the earth symbolize reigning sin in the form of our old person with his deeds being supported by organized powers of darkness. Deuteronomy 33, 13-17, And of Joseph he said, Blessed of the Lord is his land, with the precious things of heaven, with the dew and the deep lying beneath, with the precious fruits of the sun, with the precious produce of the months, with the best things of the ancient mountains, with the precious things of the everlasting hills, with the precious things of the earth and its fullness, and the favor of him who dwelt in the bush. Let the blessings come on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. Here, Joseph is called the better of his brothers. His glory is like the firstborn bull. We're talking about the purpose of the strength of God Most High or the name strength of God Most High. And his horn like the horns of the wild ox, together with them, he shall push the peoples to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. We note that, first, the prophetic promise given to Joseph belongs exclusively to his land, which we will be studying as the promise that belongs to our earthly body here on earth, which is created from the earth. Because in, in, in the time after already there in eternity, these promises won't be functioning, since in heaven, which is the house of the Most High God, there is no nation that fights against God. Second, the given fateful purpose for our earthly body is to be accomplished here on earth and because of this we need to pay attention to the original format in which these promises are addressed for the chosen by God flock in the virtue of the name of Joseph. The beginning phrase is built like this, and of Joseph he said, Blessed of the Lord is his land, with the precious things. This is the first phrase that resounded in the universe, let there be light. The concluding phrase sounds like this, let the blessing come on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. When we look at this concluding phrase, we see that in order for these blessings to become functional or actual for Joseph, then first they needed to come upon the head of Joseph and only then on Joseph himself. 
We can conclude that if Joseph would not have accepted an, an authority figure over himself in the form of his father Jacob, then God would not have been able or wouldn't have had the basis to bestow these blessings that belong to his body upon him. The name Joseph means the Lord will add more children. Clearly, the symbol of children in Scripture is always the fruit of our spirit, which is called to determine our destiny within our earthly bodies on earth. And in this situation, the symbol of the blessed destiny of Joseph within our bodies is presented in the virtue of, of the strength of the firstborn bull and the horns of the wild ox with which we are called to push the peoples to the ends of the earth. And all of these multi blessings purposed for our body we're called to inherit here on earth by confessing with our mouth the faith of our heart that needs to be clearly written upon the tablets of our heart so that the Most High, as the reader, would be able to easily read it. If our confessions with will not correspond or voice the clear essence of the confessed by us inheritance, they will be idle words that will incriminate us in a crime. Confessing with your mouth the clarity or concise essence of such inheritance, identified as the faith of our heart, provides God with a legal basis to destroy the stronghold of death in our body and replace it with the stronghold of eternal life in his appointed time. And in order to clearly write the purpose of strength as the name of God Most High upon the tablets of our heart, due to which we are called to push from within our body all nations to the ends of the earth by the means of the power of the strength of the firstborn bull and the horns of the wild ox contained in the name of Ephraim and Manasseh, it is necessary for us to know first what signs or virtues have and contain the essence of strength of the firstborn bull and the horn of the wild ox and Joseph within our heart. Second question, what purpose is contained in the name of Ephraim and Manasseh, who are called to be the foundation in order to utilize the legal power contained in the strength of the firstborn bull and wild ox? Third question, what purpose is the blessing that belongs to our earth called to accomplish here on earth in the form of our body in the name of Joseph? We've noted that the strength of the firstborn bull within our heart is identified by the ability of us abiding in Christ, in whom we are viewed as the firstborn in the sight of the Heavenly Father. Abiding in Christ by the means of the fruit of our spirit in the form of the name Manasseh, God take responsibility upon himself to present our interests in heaven, on earth, and in hell, which is why we forget all of the suffering that we have endured or overcame. Christ abiding within us by the means of the fruit of our spirit in the form of the name of Ephraim, gives us power to present the interests of the Lord Jesus in heaven, on earth, and in hell. <clears throat> and so now it's not God who presents our interests, but we, because when we are in Jesus, he presents our interests. When he is in us, we present his interests. Which is why we receive the basis to overcome the persecution that falls upon him, trample upon his haters, as dust upon the streets by the power contained in the name of Ephraim. Studying the question, what purpose is contained in the virtuous name of Ephraim and Manasseh, which are called to be the foundation for activating the legal power contained in the strength of the firstborn bull and the horn of the wild ox, Studying this question, the name Ephraim means a fertile land. At the same time, the name Manasseh means blotting out the memory of suffering. Without having these two virtues grown by us into the fruit of our spirit, in the name of Ephraim and Manasseh, we will not have any opportunity to open up the placed into us by God potential of strength of the firstborn bull and the horn of the wild ox to place ourselves in Jesus Christ. The symbol of the fertile land is the symbol of our good heart, cleansed in its conscience from dead works with the imprinted truth upon its tablets in the twelve foundations of the wall of the new Jerusalem. We conclude that the conscience cleansed from dead works with the imprinted truth upon its tablets in the twelve foundations of the wall of the New Jerusalem is the strength of the firstborn bull. 
Blotting out the memory of suffering is the symbol of the good heart that is in the likeness of an infant capable of forgiving offenses that have been done against him by fleshly Christians. Looking at question three, what will our earthly body be like on earth when the blessing that is given to our body in the name of Joseph comes to pass? <clears throat> We've noted that until man utilizes the given to him strength and power of the strength of the firstborn bull and horn of, uh, horn of the wild ox to push out of all of the enemies in the form of the old man with his deeds from his body, the blessing given to our land in the form of our body here on earth will not be claimed or applied. Considering that the holder of all of these blessings given to man in the name of Joseph is the new person and the principles of Christ together with the Holy Spirit. We note that making a covenant with God, as well as man accomplishing his role, includes fulfilling a series of conditions <coughs> so that God would be able to activate the strength of his the might of his strength and these are being a member of a specific place selected and chosen by God this is finding the good wife or virtuous wife finding your church not every church is good in the sight of God or virtuous wife there are very few of them on earth for the most part churches are the synagogue of Satan as they say it's an idle house. Although they may speak about Jesus, they may perform all kinds of encounters, they perform evangelism, they practice gifts as they call the Holy Spirit's gifts and rebuke demons, but there is no rebuking of demons there. It's just the devil playing games with them, giving them the ability to be happy as if he's coming out. And so those who rebuke are those that are, are actually uh, already affected by demons and they encourage others that they have also have demons in them. It can't be that Satan and the Holy Spirit will live in one house. If someone is baptized by the Holy Spirit, the devil can't live inside such a person. The high priest and and priests and the scribes, if you remember, said uh, that Jesus was rebuking demons by the power of demons. And so when someone is baptized by the power of the Holy Spirit and we state that this person has the spirit of fornication or other sin, then we are saying exactly the same thing as the high priests and the scribes said about Jesus. <coughs> that he, with the power of Beelzebub, was doing these things. Not a single... Uh, <clears throat> miracle or sign that they do is of the Holy Spirit and there's no evangelism there because they're not a light to the world a light for their neighbors a light for their children and a light for each other it is necessary to accept the authority of the person whom God has chosen in this church. It is necessary to have a good heart cleansed from dead works. It is necessary to have a revelations about a specific time appointed by God, and it is necessary to get to know and fulfill a specific statute. Looking at the essence of the blessings themselves that are given to our earth, which implies our earthly body, we have discovered seven blessings that are given to our body when we by the power of the strength of the firstborn bull and horn of the wild ox will push out from within our body all of the nations in the form of our old person with his deeds. Here are these seven blessings, the precious things of heaven in the form of the dew, the precious things of the deep lying beneath, the precious fruits of the sun, the precious produce of the months, the best things of the ancient mountains, the precious things of the everlasting hills, and the precious things of the earth and its fullness. When it says precious, this is a strongly yearned for the better, the chosen, the valuable, or preferred. We paid attention to the fact that the genesis and purpose of these blessings have nothing to do with materialistic valuables, does not have anything to do with and cannot have anything to do with it, as it has to do with the essence of the new person, born by God, 
in the imperishable seat of the word of truth, because it is specifically the new person who is the final piece, whose power is called to thrust the old man out with noise from out of our body, so that the new person can be enthroned in whom we are called to clothe our earthly body when we push to the ends of the earth all of the nations that are against him. The heavens of our new person called to bless our earth in the form of our body is the treasure of our good heart from which we are which are issued the springs of life containing the spectrum of all of the commandments and all of the blessings of God. Above all, keep your heart because from it come the issues of life. The issues of all blessing come from a good heart of a man. Because as much as we already know, not one of these promises are able to be accomplished or come to pass in our life if it isn't clearly written upon the tablets of our heart and is confessed with our mouth, so that God as the reader would receive the legitimate basis to accomplish it in the appointed by Him time. We already looked in short, uh, the precious things of the heavens in the form of the dew, it is the spectrum of all the good mercies of God. Our new person is the keeper and demonstrator of these mercies of God, whom we are called to enthrone in our earthly body and clothe our earthly body uh, on earth after we push the enemy nations to the ends of the earth. The dew that belongs to the precious things of heaven is a symbol of the words of a man empowered by God as the parentage of God who speaks a teaching in the revelations of the Holy Spirit about the great purpose of our earth in the form of our earthly body. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb and as showers on the grass. Deuteronomy 32, 2. Here Moses says that he is that tool that speech that will be the dew. The essence of this truth that blesses receives, received by us for our earthly body is called to serve as a catalyst, revealing the ability to push from within the boundaries of your body in the form of uh, in the boundaries of your land in the form of your body all of the enemy nations with their deeds. Second, the deep lying beneath is a symbol of the power of strength as the name of God Most High in the spirit of man, called to eradicate within our body the will abilities of the soul in order to provide God the proper grounds to turn this will or will qualities into an instrument of God. Exactly like when God transformed and made the abilities of the rod of Moses his own rod, with which Moses already not by his decisions and not his own interests, but the decisions of God and interests of God performed great miracles and signs. And to use the rod of God, which was present in the hand of Moses, according to the decisions of God and the interests of God, God used the body of Moses that received the power of the Most High, was blessed with the gifts of the deep lying beneath, as it is written. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloe planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. He shall pour water from his buckets. And when it says buckets, it's talking about entrails. And his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. There's Agag, the king, and there's the king of Jacob. And it's talking about the king of Jacob. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Numbers 24, 5 through 7. This is one of the unique prophecies of Balaam, a man that that heard the words of God and had a vision about the Almighty who said of himself that he falls but his eyes are wide open because he falls because he uh, was reoriented to materialistic things the utterance of him who hears the word of God and has the knowledge of the Most High who sees the vision of the Almighty who falls down with eyes wide open Numbers 24, 16 the phrase prophecies of Balaam that it 
will come or flow from the entrails of, of Jacob. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted, means that the confessions of the faith of the heart of Jacob <coughs> in the form of his new person that is ahead of Joseph, because Joseph will receive blessing again after the head receives it, if you remember. It will be as the depths of great waters that would rise above the depths of the waters of his soul in the form of Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Agag is the Amalekite king from Esau. These were, these were two uh, brothers, Jacob and Esau, and here we see that the one from his entrails waters will flow and the others also and it, the king of Jacob will be above the one that of the Amalekites and so to resist the depths of the waters of Agag this is pretty much the power of our fleshly mind and the spirit resisting and confronting this with the mind of G, uh, with the mind of Christ within us <coughs> and the gifts of the of the deep that lay beneath are the crushed head of Levithian, if you remember. <coughs> Psalm 74, 13. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. You struck the head of Lithiathan, and he is given as food to the people of the wilderness. In the physical world, when the nation of Israel uh, was were walking across the depths of the of the sea, he he could not see how God. They could not see how God would crush the head of the enemy. And the reason for this is because this multitude and the two uh, Joshua and Caleb lost the right to be men of the wilderness. The symbol of people that are in the category of the wilderness that Joseph was are people that have sanctified themselves to dedicate themselves to God, leaving their nation, the house of their father, and their fleshly life so that they can be clothed into the anointing of a king, priest, and prophet and receive the legitimate right to be warriors in prayer, to be able to worship the Heavenly Father in spirit and in truth. Further, for us to understand the definition of the deep lying beneath by which God blessed the land of Joseph in the form of his earthly body on earth, it is necessary for us to differentiate within our own body the one nature of deep from the other nature of deep. And the one nature of Le the Levithiathan that God hates and crushes his head to give it as food to those in the wilderness from the other form of the Levith Levithiathan who whom God is fascinated by. And the most unacceptable for the human mind is that today, due to specific situations in one body, you can have two deeps, each one or cont contrary one to another that has its own Levithiathan, and no one has ever seen physically, and no one knows about. Just like no one has ever seen the church, no one has really ever seen the church because she is concealed and people don't see her or understand and we with our physical eyes can't see the church. When God shall show her beauty and her glory, all of heaven will be in awe. Hell will be ashamed and the earth will be destroyed. And so practically the body of the saints who have accepted the promise or received the promise, the one Levithian will be given as food to the other Levithian then 
and this Leviathan that will eat or devour the other will leave behind him or will leave a trail of light. And so the, this, uh, if you read Job 41, 23 through 26, when it's talking about light, when it's talking about the right hand of the Leviathan, his right hand is like the light. And of course, this can't be referring to this to Satan or the devil. This is something concealed from man. Uh, God is fascinated by. Can you uncover his garment? It, it says in the Bible, it asks, can you? And we see here a book written from outside and inside and sealed with seven seals. And the only one who can open it is the Lamb, who overcame the lion from the uh, tribe of Judah. He can open up these outer garments or remove them t in order to see the righteousness of the church. In one of his great psalms, David spoke of the Leviathan. This great and wide sea in which is an innumerable teeming things, living things both and small and great, there the ship shall, shall ships sail about, there is that Leviathan which you have made to play there. These all wait for you that you may give them their food in due season. Psalm 104, 25-27. It's interesting, in Hebrew, when it says play, he plays in the deep of the waters is to laugh, to rejoice, to be glad, to dance, and also to make fun, fun of all the uh, sons of pride. And so he laughs at hell because he was... And so the symbol of the Leviathan that God is amazed by and that uh, plays in the depths of our waters is the new person that lives within our body who is an organic member of the body of Christ and presents within our body the might and strength of the righteousness of Christ. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion, Proverbs 28.1. And so the wicked... They're all very prideful, but when the righteous and the wicked oppose one the other, the wicked flee, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The deep waters in the body of the righteous are that what we will see further, the depths of riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. At the same time, the deep waters of the body of sin is the de are the depths of foolishness and destruction. The word de uh, deep is as the sea, or the deep of the sea, our visible universe with all of what it has, the heavens and earth, including us, was created from the great De depths from the great depths of the waters that contains the great and good goals for God that had, be, had been given in order to be a purpose or goal for men. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Genesis 1, 1, 2. God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, created in the in this deep waters uh, the firmament, which he called heaven. After which, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he separated the depths of the waters that were above the firmament and from the ones under the firmament. And then our planet Earth, presenting at that time, the depths of the waters was under the darkness of the heavens that did not yet have the two greater lights and the stars. God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, gathered the depths of the waters in one place and revealed the dry land, which he called earth. And the gathering of the waters 
he called seas. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, and God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 1, 6 through 10. If you pay attention to the definition and consistency of the deep waters, and God said that it was good. The de uh, deep waters that were gathered under the heaven and called seas are the salty water that, so, that is pretty much a third of our planet Earth, and that is not able to, uh, that is not drinkable. It's a symbol of the holiness of God. In the language of the Bible, it's also the place under the heaven, uh, under the earth, without which life would not exist. Uh, sweet water or drinkable water is also called the deep waters. It exists in rivers, under the lands as well, and lakes as well. This is a symbol of the grace of God. By the conclusions of those who study, in all, drinkable water is about 25 to 3%. Approximately 85 to 90 percent of this water that is drinkable is in the form of ice. And so we together have the depths of the waters not in the great seas but also under the earth and in the heavens. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. And so these are waters that are under the earth. The great deeps were broken up, fountains of the great deep, and the windows of heaven were opened. And so the depths, when God had taken part of the, these waters and, and put it above the heavens, the stars that we see and how much we see of them, somewhere there behind that universe, what we see, there's, there is also a capacity of, uh, of, of waters there, uh, salty waters, like here on earth. And God opened the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all of the animals that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters decreased. And only some of the rivers and lakes uh, remain. That's about two to three, two and a half to three percent of drinkable water on Earth. And these two to three percent. 85% of that is in the form of ice. The symbol of the law of grace that is presented in the drinkable water is also the format of the holiness of God, but more strict than the holiness of God that is presented in the depths of the salty waters in the great seas. If a person will, will uh, abandon the given law of God, the law of grace that is given for life in the body of Christ, if a person leaves the church of saints where the law of grace reigns by the means of the righteousness of Christ, then he tramples the Son of God underfoot and then this person will be destroyed. Not for singing the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but extorting one another, and so much the more as, this, as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. 
but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is fearful thing to fall on the hand of the living God. Hebrews 10, 25 through 31. The next definition of the good deep that we see in Scripture is uh, the circle on the face of the deep. When God created, when he when God prepared the heavens, I was there, wisdom says, when he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds, of clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundation of the earth, then I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Proverbs 8:27 through 30 for God to draw a circle on the face of the deep is drawing a circle in his entrails because God is eternal and this drew, drawing a circle means that God has placed this deep from which he created the heavens and earth and man he t took and placed it into his entrails he drew a circle so that he can establish the uh, it within his entrails by assigning limits in the form of his statutes so that the waters would not transgress his words. And this means place the depths of the waters that are the thoughts and intentions of God, place them in dependence of the word that God speaks. God placed his thoughts in dependence of his word. This is to draw the circle on the face of the deep. The next definition of the good deep that we find in Scripture is the righteousness of God and the destinies that are prepared for His people. Your righteousness is like the great mountains, your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. Psalm 36, 6. According to this place of Scripture, we can see that the great destinies for the chosen by God flock is our justification that is given to us in the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has known the mind of the Lord in this de these depths of waters? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. Romans 11, 33-36. The phrase, for him and through him and to him means that the depth of the riches of and knowledge of God in the uncomprehending and unsearchable goals of God come from Christ and are in Christ. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. In him was the depth of wisdom and knowledge, and he began from his entrails to pour out these de this deep. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in him, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. A person will have this deep that can that consists of loving water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John seven thirty seven through thirty nine. According to this place of Scripture, the great deep of living waters that come from the entrails of Christ are personified in the Holy Spirit that is given to those who thirst by faith in Jesus Christ. In this way, when we receive the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life, 
we receive him in receive him into ourselves as in the, as these deep waters as the unsearchable riches of Christ but the Leviathan that is in these deep waters and uh, leaving behind a trail of light is the uh, our sacred person that is of a humble and contrite spirit this path that he leaves behind of light is the ability of a God to communicate with man. Upon this path, this path of righteousness, a person creates this himself, accepting this grace of God into himself, he stirs up this deep, he activates this deep so that God can do something or say something. The Holy Spirit did that too when he was hovering and trembling over the depths of the waters. He, in this way, was stirring up these waters. He, the thoughts of God, he was stirring them, he was uh, activating them so he may say them. And now let's look at the bad form of deep that needs to be uh, swallowed up by the good deep that God had placed into his son and said it was good. The bad nature of deep that is opposite to the good nature of deep waters within our essence that we see in scripture is linked to the name of hell which is the state of the heart of a man and the personified Leviathan, the serpent Jonah 2, 5 through 10. The water surrounded me even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the mooring of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah into dry land. To be able to crush the head of the serpent and the head of Leviathan, and to give it as food to the people in the wilderness is necessary to deprive this serpent of the weapon he has, the waters that come out of his mouth, which is in the format of slogans. Be careful for this. When a strong man fully armed guards his own place, his, good, his goods are in, in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. The strong man fully armed is... And so the stronger one is the old man with his deeds. The strong man fully armed guard uh, who guards his place is the holiness of God's law that discovers the sin and gives power to sin. And so this... Uh, Lithiathan, as we know, needs to be devoured or swallowed up. And so the tool of the old man that presents within our body this ancient serpent that is called devil and Satan is written in Revelations 12, 15 through 17. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelations 12, 15 through 17. The earth that helped the woman in the form of the river that came out of the mouth of the serpent is an earthly body for which we have accepted the promise that belongs to the door of our hope to destroy the stronghold of death within our earthly body and replace it with the stronghold of life in the resurrection of Christ. Specifically, when we accept this promise for our body, then what the dragon has 
released from his mouth to destroy us. In order to destroy us, we destroy him. We overcome him. And instead of eating us, he becomes food for us. That is our old person with his deeds. The next name of this bad deep that we see, this bad, de- uh, bad, these bad deep waters, is the name of Apollyon, which means destruction or perishing. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth. And to them... And so the fifth angel who had this trumpet are the, are the, is the elementary principles of Christ. The star that fell to the earth is one of the religious unclean spirits that abides under the heavens that in, is part of the principalities of this age that presents himself as the angel of light. And so the deep that's within uh, the bodies of evil people are the pseudo-truth or a falsified version of truth and what they confess. And it was told to this scorpions and to this locust, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. These are the, the symbol of the grass and the green things and the trees is a symbol of people that have upon their forehead the seal of God Most High. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will not. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape, and so five months, is not a time frame, but the ven- sim- symbol of vengeance. And so these shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for a battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the face of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek it has the name Apollyon. And so this locusts that represents the pseudo-truth in body of men that do not have the seal of God upon their forehead are like these <coughs> horses prepared for battle. This is a symbol of their emotion, emotions where that does not have uh, peace. The pseudo-golden crowns are pseudo-righteousness because the true crown is the uh, crown of righteousness, but this is a crown that's based upon their own virtuous work that they have made their own hope. The uh, human faces that were of locusts are the gathering of Satan that present earthly wisdom and the, that of the flesh and hell. That is in contrary to the wisdom of the truth of the Church of God. The hair like a woman's hair is a symbol of pseudo-theocracy. And this either is manifested in dictatorship or in to- in total tolerance. And so the teeth of these locusts being like uh, lion's teeth is a pseudo-love, which is uh, a symbol of tolerance or a tolerant love. And so breastplate is a pseudo-righteousness that uh, tries to affect uh, because iron 
is judgment uh, is a judgment of others, and they try to take part in parliament and other places so that they would present their interests. The sound of their wings, like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle, is a symbol of pseudo-anointing that imitates sanctification in the form of uh, encounters as pseudo-rebuking of demons and Practicing, practicing spiritual gifts. Having tails like scorpions, there were stings in their tails. This is the sting of death that comes from sin, that receives its power from the law that does, uh, reveals sin. The sting of death is sin. And so this bottomless pit, whose name is Hebrew, in Hebrews, Abaddon or Apollyon, we see in the book of Job the noise of horror were in their ears and the, the one that destroys is coming. He sees before himself the sword. He searches bread all about. These are people, again, this, the, all these things symbolize a person who does, who's seeking uh, word uh, from others and because they have nothing of their own. They know that the day of darkness is coming upon them and that they are pursued because they stretch their hand against God and the Most High. To resist the Most High tra transforms a person into the unclean that is not able to be renewed with repentance and that he in his subconscious knows that the day of darkness or destruction is upon him. The next symbol of the bad deep waters is as hell or where the dead are that died out of Christ. The dead tremble, those under the waters and those inhabiting them. Sheol is naked before him and destruction has no covering. Job 26, 5, 6. In this place of scripture, those that are uh, fearing or those that fear are those in the symbol of the giants in the days. The dead tremble those under the waters, those inhabiting them. The phrase here means that hell is known and revealed before the Lord. Sheol is naked before him and destruction has no covering is the symbol of the deep that uh, confronts the good deep is going to forever be ashamed. The translation of this place of scripture is this is a place of wilting or decay or destruction and so this is a symbol of a person that in his body there's destruction and decay and has this hell already inside of himself. Hell and destruction are before the Lord so how much more the hearts of the son of men? Proverbs 15, 11. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.8.9 At the same time, the good deep within a man is demonstrated in uh, image of God himself. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake in your likeness. To be satisfied when you awaken his likeness is transformed into the image from glory to glory. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. Second Corinthians 3.18 Looking at the glory of the Lord, which is the abiding of Christ, 
Christ in our heart, we devour or this uh, bad deep that is within our body, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. So our time is up. We will bend our knees, however, who is comfortable, and we will thank God for that word that we will able to hear today about that good deep and about the bad deep and the good and mysterious Levithian <coughs> and the evil Levithian as the serpent who are also enemies. But everything is already decided by God. The Levithian that God is amazed by, which is within the depths of his wisdom, will devour the other Levithian. It will be given to the men of the wilderness, to men who had sanctified themselves. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your revelations, for your word that you again and again reveal upon this place that you have given to worship your name so that in this worship your saints would be able to know the depths of your wisdom so that they could fit this deep inside of themselves so that they be carriers of your deep so that you can be in awe of them. You concealed in the essence of Levithian your new person and your church, and you placed your son as head of them, and no one can know and see him. Hell and Abaddon have heard of him with their ears. And you said that the place of the depths of, of these deep waters is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the place for the deep revelations of God. And when we have the fear of the Lord in our heart, we have a place for these deep the depths of God's wisdom and knowledge. May your mercy be blessed that is forever and ever for your chosen ones who, according to your word, have cast off the old man with his deeds, have left their nation, died for their nation, for the house of their father, and for the desires of their soul and have renewed their mind by the spirit of their mind which is the mind of Christ in their spirit and after that began the process of clothing themselves into their new person just as you had once from the depths of the waters created the universe and man you in the same way continue to, from the depths of your waters, your thoughts, to create and construct your person who will be in your likeness, who will become your house forever, and who even now is so, because you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, live in the bodies of these people, and their bodies have become the temple of your Holy Spirit, your temple, your sanctuary. May your mercy be a blessing for your people, so that they may see these blessings, and for the sake of these blessings, they can clothe themselves into the strength of the firstborn bull so that he can push away and push out within himself this old man with his deeds that is supported by organized powers of the under heavens. We thank you that you have given us the power to stand upon all the work of the enemy and destroy the strongholds of Satan, and first of all, within our mind, and after that, in the minds of those who will resist the truth to give 
to the people of the wilderness this Levithian as food but first you will crush his head and I thank you for this revelation for this mercy and I worship before you together with your saints our great God Son and Holy Spirit Amen our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen and now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless for the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen